Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive of the RSA. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for this uh, very special RSA Thursday lunchtime event. Before we begin, can you turn your mobile phone uh, to silent? We're filming and live streaming today, as always, so a big welcome to those of you joining us online. The hashtag for the event, uh, if you want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter, either from uh, the room or if you're watching remotely, is RSA Value. Now, we like our rock star intellectuals here uh, at the RSA, and so I'm delighted to welcome today's speaker, Mariana Mazzucato. How did I do? Very good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Professor Mazzucato needs a very radical introduction, so I'll keep the list of her impressive achievements succinct, partly because I'm just green with of envy and jealousy. Um, Mariana holds the Chair in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at UCL. She's founder and director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She's an award-winning, best-selling author of many influential books on progressive economic policy. She advises an unbelievable array of key international policymakers. You, you may in your questions just want to just randomly shout names and she'll say, oh yeah, I've advised them, I've talked to them. Have you spoken to Mr. Trump yet? No, but no. I got a hug from Rick Perry, unfortunately. So, there we go, you see. <laughs> Uh, so she advises key international policymakers on innovation-led inclusive growth. Her new book, uh, which I've been very much enjoying myself, it's, uh, it's, it's combines an enormous amount of substance and research with being, with being incredibly readable. So her new book, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, just been published by Alan Lane to wide acclaim. And it argues that our failure to distinguish between value creators and value extractors is one of the things that has driven the creation of an unequal and unhappy Society. So, without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Professor Mariana Mazzucato. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively informal. I really want to engage with some of the sort of storytelling around value. I'm not going to get too technical. And I want to begin with um, just reminding you something that Ed Miliband said uh, when he was called Red Ed. Um, I was about to say Red Ken, Red Ed, where he actually talked about the need to distinguish uh, productive versus predatory capitalism. And it was very interesting because I thought that that actually could have led to a whole discussion in this country, kind of bringing back that idea that there's different types of capitalism and how might we steer the economy in a particular way. And that really went to the heart, actually, of what I'll be talking about. And I do want to say that it's a big pity that somehow that conversation ended, but it's also a conversation that actually began a long time ago, even before this great quote here by one of the big US trade unionists. But uh, Big Bill Haywood you know, basically was saying, how can it be that we have these gold barons? You know, they're making all this money. They're extracting money, when actually those that are literally extracting the gold from the ground, so the miners who are milling it, who are mining it, are getting nothing. Right. So this kind of brings us to you know, the other big global debate, which is all about the 1% and the 99% and what can we do about it. And basically, one of the key things I want to argue is that rather than only thinking about these issues in terms of redistribution, as important as redistribution policies are, we do need a progressive taxation system, if we only think about it that way, without going back to the beginning of where does wealth come from, where does value actually come from, it actually becomes extremely hard to have progressive taxation. So if you do tax the wealth, as Piketty uh, makes that very strong call for at the end of his book, excellent book on inequality, Capital, it, 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 it becomes not very resilient in terms of a policy. It can easily be undone if, there, if it's not actually based on an understanding of where wealth comes from. And so that's what I'd like to engage you to think about. And I have this sort of cartoon image here. Uh, which perhaps I can convince the RSA to do an animation around, because I'm going to try to animate it for you, jumping in and outside the fence. This whole notion of who creates value, who extracts value, and could it be that by not actually getting that distinction right, we also destroy value? Um, this was a big conversation for many years, um, and it actually drove economic thinking. It drove economic thinking because the concept of value, so productive, unproductive labor, was actually at the heart of how economists kind of thought, taught, contested each other. And you shouldn't forget John Maynard Keynes' great quote, which was that practitioners on the ground who think they're just kind of doing good or bad stuff and think they don't need to worry about economic theory are actually slaves of defunct economic theory. So the, de the degree to which and how we engage with this debate about productive, unproductive, value creation, value extractive, um, does actually guide policymakers. But when that becomes invisible, when we stop debating that, 
policymakers can also get extremely confused and more susceptible, more captured, more corrupted by particular uh, uh, ideas about who the value creators are. So I have on this slide some uh, proclamations that hopefully you've heard. So Lloyd Blankfein, unashamedly, after the crisis, Goldman Sachs CEO said, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. So what do we mean by that? What do we mean by the value that's actually produced by Goldman Sachs workers? What is the measure of productivity and of value underlying that? Silicon Valley wealth creators. This is, by the way, one of the things that I, in my previous book, kind of tackled. But one of the reasons I wrote this one was that in 2015, after the Labor Party lost the election, I was astounded that the day later, um, I think it was Tony Blair, he wrote an article saying, we lost because we didn't embrace the wealth creators business. And I thought, how can you call yourself a Labour Party member and actually completely dismiss all the other actors in the economy who are co-creating alongside business, alongside the you know, tech companies or the pharmaceutical companies, wealth, right? So wealth creators to mean just business, and in particular, nowadays we use it to talk about you know, the innovative kind of high-tech businesses, that's a problem. Um, as well as after Brexit, ring fencing financial services because of the value that they create for the economy. That's very strong as an assumption. Uh, high prices of drugs justified through concepts of value like value-based pricing, which I'm going to go into later. This might be a word that you're familiar with because there's been lots of uh, uh, discussions around the world. How can it be that you know, the uh, drugs for hepatitis C are costing hundreds of thousands of um, dollars or euros or pounds, and the justification always goes back to value and through this concept that is kind of muddly if we don't know what it means. And then the opposite. So you know, the state is not really a value creator. We don't have words for it. At best, it facilitates value creation. At best, it redistributes value for uh, progressive thinkers, but it doesn't actually create it. Um, and so, as I said, you know, this question was actually at the heart of economic theory for 400 years. And I'm not going to you know, pedantically go through all these different bodies of thought, because otherwise I'd have to lock the doors and keep you in here for at least half a day. But basically, if you look at the history of thought from the mercantilists, the physiocrats, the classicals, they had different theories, but they did bring it back down to this issue of how to steer the economy in such a way that we make it more productive and perhaps nurture and reward those activities that we think are actually creating stuff. Adam Smith especially brought it down to material stuff. He had a material versus non-material notion. Uh, Marx was much more subtle than that. But they all had different uh, takes on it. So the mercantilists at a time in which there was a lot of trade and there was uh, the, the, the emphasis on terms of trade uh, put the focus on exchange. And so they wanted to make sure that the exchange rates were right, the terms of exchange were right. This kind of, you know, think of Trump today, basically. He's gone back about 400 years. Uh, the physiocrats in a, in, a, in a period in which most wealth was still created on agricultural lands, not surprisingly put value, so productive uh, capital um, in, in basically in what farmers were doing in land. And they had a very interesting, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, the tableau economique, which actually divided uh, society into three different uh, uh, classes, but really the productive ones were the farmers. Um, and classical economic theory, so Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. I hate to tell you, Matthew, actually, my stopwatch isn't working. Oh, yes, that is good. Um, just to make sure I don't go over. Um, the classical economists who were writing during the Industrial Revolution, um, not surprisingly, put labor and industrial labor at the heart of where they thought uh, that sort of production boundary uh, lied. And what I want to argue, and I'll, I'll come to this at the end, but let me just give you the punchline now so that you sort of follow what I'm saying, is that then something happened. Okay? We moved from an objective theory where there were sort of concrete things that we could say perhaps were at the center of the value creation process to a more subjective understanding. So preferences and kind of value um, in, in the eye of the beholder. And I want to concentrate on what the implications of that are today for some of the biggest ills that I think are affecting our economy. And it's not going to be surprising that I'll start with what's happening around finance and financialization of the economy. But just, just believe me that today in neoclassical economics, which is taught all over the world um, in economics departments, first of all, what's interesting is they don't even talk about value. There's one theory of value being taught. And we've sort of rid economics departments of this history, history of different theories of value. Um, but also uh, uh, by, by then not questioning it, it doesn't even have to be called value theory. In fact, the word itself has disappeared. It's basically Econ 101. 
Okay? And so that's actually the key point in the book. What happens when value is no longer contested? Different takes on value. What happens also to policymakers' ability to steer the economy in particular ways that create more or less value? So as I said, what was quite interesting in the uh, physiocrats who were writing in the 1700s, different ones, Canet, Turgot were the most famous. They actually um, didn't always agree on everything. They had three different classes, and it was the productive class were definitely the farmers. And this was probably the first ever Excel spreadsheet, uh, <laughs> in fact. Uh, and, and really what the question was, you know, when value was produced by the farmers, how it's then actually distributed and the degree to which it gets reinvested back into the land versus siphoned off by the proprietors, who were basically the landlords. Um, and then the sterile class, that wasn't actually the worst class, it was the proprietors who were siphoning it out of the system. The sterile class, who were basically the merchants, were of course important for getting the goods, the farming goods, to the shops. But if that part of society, the merchant class, was too large, that would actually then hurt the actual kind of key engine of, um, of growth, which was in the farm. Um, and Adam Smith is actually quite interesting. We were just talking, Matthew and I, about uh, uh, the theater, because we just saw each other there. And I really think that uh, Adam Smith must have just gone to the opera when he wrote this, when he was looking at uh, productive and unproductive labor, because he really had it in it for opera singers and opera dancers. You know, it's not just, he had this whole list of the unproductive members of society, and opera singers and opera dancers are not productive. Anyway, his, don't, you obviously are not going to read this whole thing, but just to say, he had, you know, it, it was quite interesting because um, he had what was basically a classical labor theory of value, but he made a very clear distinction between it, um, literally in terms of what uh, people were doing, the category of work, whereas Marx, who came after him, um, was much more subtle. He said that, yes, you know, labor is where value comes from, but it doesn't mean then that if you are in the financial sector, you're unproductive. He tied the concept of production and productive labor to whether surplus value was being created. And surplus value, as you know, was tied to his understanding of labor exploitation. So as long as the activity, he didn't look at sectors or categories of work, the activity of a particular financier or merchant was in fact allowing that surplus value to be realized, then he called them productive. But it wasn't a normative point. This wasn't productive as good, unproductive as bad. He was looking at what actually produces profits and the degree to which those profits are reinvested, allowing the capitalist accumulation process to happen. And the key insights from the classicals was, first of all, that um, there was a very strong objective component right, of value. It was tied to cost of production, to labor, to the division of labor. Uh, the RSA has just done a great uh, review of labor and work and the effect that, that new forms of work uh, have a, a potential uh, future of both wages and amount of work, so employment. And he was actually looking at those issues too, right? So his whole pin factory example, which has gone down in history as being very important in thinking about the division of labor, was very much tied also to the changing conditions, the changes in technological change and how that affects the organization of production, but the reason he cared was because labor was at the center of the value creation process. And of course, Marx as well. The reason I, by the way, became an economist who focuses a lot on innovation is because I actually read Capital, volume one, two, and three, in three languages, believe it or not, because I actually became an economist in Mexico City. That's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> as a history major, I did my junior year abroad in Mexico and then left this uh, a program to actually go study economics in the economics department in the UNAM, and they were reading Marx. And I was fascinated when I was reading Marx with capitalism. So the real interesting thing in Marx is even though he was a critic of capitalism, as we all know, he actually appreciated the, the role of technological change and was looking, again, at the big questions that we asked today about the effect of robots on employment. He was already looking at that then. David Ricardo, famous chapter he wrote in 1821 in his principles uh, textbook, he was looking at a chapter called On Machinery. He was already back then looking at the effect that machinery, which was again happening because of the Industrial Revolution, was having on both employment and wages. So all these guys really focused on innovation, production, division of labor, change in this objective way, as well as this issue around reproduction of the system. You know, if too much is being siphoned out, so in the case of the physiocrats already looking at the siphoning out from the role of landlords, then the system would potentially uh, fall apart. And it was, they also had a very interesting concept about rent, um, uh, very different from how it's used today. So don't think of rent in terms of the, the price you're paying for accommodation, 
but rent potentially, in their view, as people making money by actually not doing much, just moving stuff around, right? So they, they talked about unearned income. I think I have a quote later by uh, 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 Smith um, on that. But rent as unearned income, I'll show you, is quite different from how it then was approached in neoclassical economics, where, as I've already said, the big change was focus on preferences, right? So the change is, I'm going to be super simplistic, from classical economics that had a theory of value objectively tied to cost of production and innovation, which transformed itself to a theory of price. Okay? What, what, these, what this body of thought then did was reverse that logic. Theories of price and supply and demand curves and preferences and utility. I'm looking at you guys starting to fall asleep as I'm saying these words, but believe me, it's really exciting. Um, turning that into a theory of value. So as long as something has a price, legally, so I'm not talking about illegal prostitution or illegal drugs, even though both of those activities might be legal in some countries, and so in that case it would apply to them, uh, would be how we then measure whether something is valuable or not. And this is, of course, why Blankfein can say Goldman Sachs producers, uh, workers, are the most productive in the world because it's actually almost tautological. If you're paid a huge amount of money, it's kind of like your price of your work, wages, um, then you obviously must be very valuable because that is, in fact, how we measure output. Um, and and you know, all the different factors of production, so capital, labor, and land, are earning according to their marginal productivity, which is also revealed through prices. So it's prices. It's prices which are then also a reflection of supply and demand, and hence preferences, so you know, wages even, are related to the preferences for leisure versus work. You know, out the window goes the, um, the class struggle. Uh, so why do I say that? Because actually wages in the classical economists, even in uh, Adam Smith were in fact tied to this objective issue around power relations, you know, who owns the means of production and who actually has to sell their labor to it. That, obviously, I'm saying it more in Marxian terms, but the class struggle and power relationships were very much at the core of how they understood um, income being distributed, both in terms of rent, so the power that rentiers might have and extracting without doing anything, um, and workers. So price reveals value, and rent's no longer about unearned income, but asymmetries towards, a, eventually, a competitive price. You can actually just get rid of, of this asymmetry, uh, potentially through competition. And so Adam Smith, you know, again, there was no debate about that. He was just saying landlords actually, their extraction has its origin in robbery, right? They are reaping where they've never sowed, unearned income versus, again, just an imperfection, which we can get away. The notion of monopoly profits uh, is this kind of latter view. Um, right, so what happens, and this is sort of the key point in the book, I don't do something, I kind of regret, by the way, I, I shouldn't say this out loud, you shouldn't, as you're presenting a book, say, I should have, you know, this thing that they say, I, th I think they call it l'esprit de l'escalier, am I saying it really badly? After you, you, you get interviewed on Channel 4 News and you leave, I should have said that. You know, that happens to me all the time. And here, I shouldn't be, as I'm presenting a book, I should have written that. But I did it for a reason. I didn't, sorry, what, what am I even talking about? I didn't actually present my own theory of value, right? That is not what I did in the book, on purpose. What I did was say, what happens when this distinction between productive and unproductive becomes invisible? Because, in fact, value is in the eye of the beholder. It depends how much you're earning. Then you're valuable. A whole sector might be um, ignored initially in our understanding of, uh, of productive labor because we think it's actually um, you know, not very useful. Again, maybe the financiers or the landlords. But if we have an idea that actually it's just based on price, well, then it depends what they're earning. Um, and does that actually then also allow and almost nurture the ability of certain elements of society to call themselves wealth creators and to present their importance in terms of value creation in order to extract. So the landlords were extracting, but they didn't pretend to be innovative. They didn't pretend to be creative. They didn't pretend to be wealth creators. They just said, give me the money. That's why Adam Smith says robbery, right? Um, whereas what I would argue is today, and I'm being a bit simplistic, but not too much, most value extraction happens in the name of value creation. That's what's different. And it's extremely confusing for the practitioners on the ground. If they're then presented this wonderful narrative, I'm a wealth creator, oh, can you then introduce the patent box policy? Which we can perhaps in the discussion, I'll tell you why it's a very stupid policy that we've bought into, uh, lobbied for by basically one pharmaceutical company. And if you look at how they lobbied for it, it was through our wealth creation. Or capital gains tax, which fell by 
close to 50% in five years, and the US and then the UK followed, um, lobbied for by the National Venture Capital Association at the time in the US, the end of the 1970s, in terms of their wealth creation uh, uh, role. You, know, you want an innovative economy? You want the knowledge economy? Reduce my capital gains. I'm an innovator, do that, right? So again, these, these stories that are being told are extremely powerful. Um, so what are the implications? I'm going to run through this quite quickly. I have about seven minutes left. Um, and so the first is output, how we measure, right? GDP, you've all heard it if you watch the news. It's how we measure the amount of goods and services produced in the economy. You will be surprised to hear, I hope, or actually I don't hope, you might be surprised to hear, that uh, finance, the sector, was actually not included in how we measure GDP up until the 1970s. Why? Because it was basically just seen, kind of like the classicals saw it, as a movement of money. It wasn't necessarily said this is bad, but no, we shouldn't include that, just like we don't include social security payments, right? It's just a movement of existing wealth, existing funds from one group to another. And then what happened was it started to become a bit too big, the sector. That's my next slide here. You start seeing the role of financial intermediation. It's literally its role in the economy as a percentage of gross value added. Um, this is for the U. Actually, up top there is a graph from the Bank of England, Andy Haldane's work, which is very good on this. It completely started to outpace the rest of the economy. And you can read what the accountants started doing. This is in the UN. They had a group looking at the um, national accounting system. And they literally started to use the words like awkward. This is a bit strange. This huge thing, which is starting to sort of you know, take over the economy in terms of growth, we're not even accounting for it. So they said, well, let's just give it a price, right? So things like the price that you were uh, being charged to get a mortgage had been included, because it was very clear there was a price to it that would be included in GDP. But things like net interest payments, the difference between what banks had been earning through interest that you pay them versus what they're paying you, that difference had not been included, because that was what was being seen as just a transfer. And that ended up getting included, how? Through the naming of what they were doing as financial intermediation. Uh, later, also with the investment banks, what they were doing was risk taking, right? So then we include these as uh, goods, well actually, sorry, services that were being provided by the sector that were productive for the economy, and there was a price set to it. And in fact, the profits being earned, the, the bottom one here is for the US, um, in the sector also increased, which is, very interesting, I think, and I talk about this in the book in terms of performativity. What happens, uh, this is a concept, by the way, that comes more from sociology and philosophy, when you start changing how you account for things, how you measure the performance of a sector or a particular actor in the economy, what it does also to their kind of confidence, right? So, you know, you are now valuable. Oh, I'm valuable? Well, then I need this and that. I need less regulation. I need less tax. I need you know, these other handouts or favors from different parts of the economy, including today with Brexit, we must protect these financial services. Otherwise, oh God, everything will fall apart. Um, and so it affects behavior and confidence, which then feeds back into how we measure performance and how we account and how we uh, uh, talk about these things. Um, corporate governance is quite interesting. So this, you know, I often say that uh, in, um, in, uh, we, we, we often, uh, how do you say, focus on financialization as a problem given the graph I just showed, right? The size of the financial sector, but one of the real issues is the size of um, the degree to which companies in the real economy are being financialized through practices like share buybacks. And it's quite extraordinary how that particular practice is in fact something that people have quite explicitly talked about as potentially extractive because you're not using your profits to plow them back into production, you're using them simply to buy back your shares, to boost your stock options, to boost supply, uh, sorry, surprise, surprise, executive pay. But as long as that's the type of critique, oh, they're extractive, that's bad, that's predatory capitalism, not much changes. If you tie it back to debunking, or if you tie it back to the theory of value behind that, so shareholder value, and then start debunking some of the assumptions that underlie it, that might become a much stronger critique and actually get us some change versus what we're having today, which is increasing uh, amount of share buybacks. So uh, companies like Apple under Steve Jobs actually plowed most of the profits back in. Uh, Tim Cook, massive share buyback schemes. And the theory of value underneath shareholder value is a theory of risk taking. I, again, don't have too much time, I'll just tell you quickly. Shareholders are seen as the residual claimants 
the ones who get something at the end, hence they're the biggest risk takers, right? Everyone else has a guaranteed rate of return. Um, so workers have their salaries, governments have, um, uh, you know, they just kind of do stuff that's kind of not very risky. Uh, banks have their interest rate. And of course, this was actually the point in the entrepreneurial state, which I unpicked. Governments, of course, are taking big risks, right? Every time they invest in things like the internet, there's lots of failure uh, as well. Uh, but workers as well, you might take on a job that doesn't have a very high wage or salary with the expectation you might have a long career in that uh, workplace, but there's no guarantee of that, right? That's risk taking itself. So opening up this idea that actually value is not only created collectively, it's kind of a stakeholder value kind of concept, but also that the risk taking itself is much more collective than has been assumed with this particular model uh, requires actually going to the heart of that. Um, and in fact, these share buybacks here, you see some of these numbers, over 100% of uh, net income in many of these top companies, as important as ones in energy and health and IT, spending over 100% of net income on this uh, combination of dividends and uh, stock buybacks. And this, in fact, has grown over time, so the percentage of cash flows returned to shareholders, and this has affected what today is a record level profit to wage relationship. Um, so let me just move on. Um, oh, sorry, and this is obviously related also to one of the biggest crises we have worldwide in advanced economies, which is falling levels of business investment. And if we remember that actually it's both public and private investment that not only got us the IT revolution, but that are, are required to get us the green revolution, These, you know, this lack of investment back into the economy is also steering growth around too much of the kind of financialized uh, finance growing above the rest of the economy, but also steering it away from potential new sources of um, opportunities like green growth. Uh, big pharma uh, is, is, is very interesting because otherwise we spend too much time talking about finance. And I already mentioned before this term value-based pricing, but this is the most explicit, I think, almost uh, example of that logic that went from uh, 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 price to value. So the problem, of course, is that for many drugs, uh, for very important uh, uh, diseases, whether it's cancer or hepatitis C, cost this extraordinary amount of money. And it used to be justified by the company saying, well, we have to recoup our R&D costs until different people, including myself, sort of started to show who was actually paying for lots of the early stage high risk R&D. And so they needed the public sector, uh, so in the US it's over 30 billion a year, they needed a different theory, right? And this concept of value-based pricing was very interesting, and um, one of the heads in Gilead Science actually just said it explicitly, um, you know, just stop talking about prices, what we should actually be talking about value, and value and value-based pricing is basically what the market will bear. So what is the value that you would place by not having that drug? Again, going right back to this issue of preferences, subjective, right? How much do you actually value basically your life by not having that drug? There's different ways that they have to calculate that. But it definitely is a, it's a very subjective and preference-focused uh, uh, issue. And in fact, Goldman Sachs, just last week, I think it was, they were like, oh, God, yeah, yeah, curing patients is just such a bad business model anyway. Um, and <laughs> it's wonderful. I love it when they say stuff like this. It's like, yeah, OK, they said it, you know, very clear. Um, and lastly, in the whole digital economy space, all this stuff about privacy and Facebook and all the uh, you know, Senate hearings in the last days where Zuckerberg's like, yeah, sorry, don't worry, we'll, we'll fix it. Um, this is also an area where I think it's very interesting because if we think of, again, value actually being produced much more collectively than the concept both of shareholder value gives us, but also this idea of the production function where really all the value is being created within businesses and at best the public sector can redistribute that value if we actually look at both the technology that's underlying these high-tech companies and platform capitalism itself having been funded collectively, but also the data itself, which today is at the is, is, is the real issue, right? Data is the new oil, or yeah, oil is the new data. No, I mean, data is the new kind of petrol in terms of uh, how rent seeking can potentially happen. That data, of course, is also owned collectively. So it also shouldn't become a race to the bottom where everyone is potentially just thinking about their privacy. But as Evgeny Morozov says, we should think and conceptualize this data as something we own in common, not as something as, that we own just as individuals with our individual preferences for a little bit more, a little bit less privacy. And um, we might in the discussion bring this back to the issue of UBI if, if there's time. 
Um, and lastly, how we think about government, you know, the degree to which we should or should not have austerity, what's the ideal size of government. Uh, this also comes back down to how we measure government, which you will um, hopefully be shocked to hear that in GDP, we only measure the salaries and the costs of government activities. We don't actually measure the value that's created. There's no real price put to the benefits of a more healthy, more educated society. So it's not very surprising that we can't even measure the productivity of government in the way that Lloyd Blankfein could talk about the productivity of Goldman Sachs workers. And this effect also, just like I said with finance, feeds back into how civil servants feel. So I often feel like I walk in as an economist and walk out as a life coach when I talk to uh, uh, policymakers. No, no, I'm serious. They're depressed. They are depressed. And it's, it has to do with these issues of how we value uh, government. Um, and this is why actually I'm spending a lot of time founding and now directing this institute, which actually goes right to that part of the problem, which is we don't even have the term public value in economics. We have the word public good, but it's extremely narrow, and it's used to tell the BBC, stop making soap operas and talk shows, just make documentaries about giraffes in Africa and high quality news, but because we can't actually capture the kind of value that ambitious public entities are um, trying to create independent, literally, in that case, of the format. Um, so I'm finished. I just want to end with this slide, you know, what to do. Well, first of all, let's admit that value is, in fact, created collectively. And that, these, and, and that this concept of value in some ways has been hijacked by putting it just at the level of individual preferences. This has also really made it much easier, as I've already said, for these narratives and storytelling about value to be used to uh, capture uh, policymakers' minds. We need to understand that both also in the policy process, it's not just fixing markets, but actively together co-shaping and co-creating them. And it also, coming back to Marx, when I said that Marx was a bit, I don't want to say brighter, but granular than Adam Smith, he said it's not the category of work, so it's not that finance is bad in or out, it depends what it's doing. And so similarly, instead of bashing the hedge funds and the credit default swaps as simply extractive versus industry, when actually industry is quite financialized, as I've said, really thinking of what are the serious revolutionary reforms we could be doing, not the tinkering on the edges, to steer finance back into the production boundary. Let's actually make it productive. And this isn't, by the way, just lending to SMEs the usual kind of myth about where value comes from. This is really rethinking how, as Minsky did, about how to nurture the degree to which capital development of the economy and innovation can really be fostered by particular types of finance. It means definancializing the real economy. It means really linking prices to how they're produced. So the marginal price of most drugs is actually zero. Um, but also linking it, perhaps delinking how we set prices from those costs actually and thinking more about values around uh, access. You know, what, do we act what kind of healthcare system do we actually want collectively and actually then use the price system to achieve that value versus vice versa. It could affect how we govern um, knowledge and the whole IPR system, which is one of the most areas that have been hijacked and captured by these stories about value creation. Um, and it could also, this is something I usually obsess about, actually help us steer the direction of growth through much more explicit ways to talk about this co-creation of markets through public purpose uh, missions. And the last line in my book is this, uh, which is, I think, quite hopeful because actually we can change things because it comes down to organizations that can be governed in different ways and interact in different ways through this explicit recognition of the collective value creation process. And we shouldn't forget Plato's great uh, uh, word when he, uh, sorry, sentence when he said um, uh, that uh, storytellers rule the world. And unless we fundamentally change the stories we're telling about value, it's going to be extremely hard to actually get a more progressive distribution of that value because we're going to continue to have value extraction being done in the name of uh, value creation. And that's it. Thanks, Marina. That was fabulous. Uh, world wind tour of, uh, um, uh, of ideas. I'm just going to ask two or three questions because I think the room's probably bursting with people uh, who want to ask you questions, and some of them, I'm sure, are more economically literate than I am, so I'll uh, leave it to them. But um, my first question is that uh, in your kind of critique of neoclassical ideas, isn't there a danger here that what we're doing is we're mistaking a heuristic? And, and I mean, there's a mistake also that that they make themselves, 
that, in a sense, what actually they argued, or the more thoughtful neoclassical people argued, is they didn't argue, for example, that human beings genuinely are perfectly informed individuals in a perfectly rational universe, nor did they genuinely believe that, the, that value is only measured by price. What they're actually saying is, this is just the best way of trying to predict things. This is just the best way of trying to describe things. Because the problem is, and you recognize this yourself, once you get into more philosophically, substantively based accounts of value, you move into a kind of morass. It becomes much more difficult to develop models and to plan and to things like that. So are you accusing them of misunderstanding reality when actually what they're doing is just saying that this is the most efficient way of trying to work things out? So I would almost argue the opposite, that they became too philosophical, that you know, these, um, that the labor theory of value, which is not, again, the point of the book is not, let's go back to the labor theory of value, but if we look at the intricate thinking that, um, that Smith, Ricardo Marx had, it was in fact tied to something much more basic. It wasn't you know, high level philosophy, it was costs. But not static costs, it wasn't you know, how much does this cost, that should be the price. It was really understanding what I would call the structural composition of the economy, the changes in that structure, technological change, again, division of labor, this is not about, you know, Heidegger and, and thinking about, or, or Bentham's, you know, view of, of happiness. This is the structural composition of the economy. And when you take it away from that, and it shouldn't just be wet to that, because that would be purely deterministic. And Marx himself, by the way, talked about supply and demand, but that was kind of icing on the cake. He came back to centers of gravity that had to do with technological change and production. That, that's quite, that would be really useful today with the pharmaceutical industry because actually one of the ways they justify prices is also in terms of opportunity costs, which is actually much more philosophical <laughs> than, the, than the real cost of production. Opportunity costs are the costs that you, or in, in this case, the profits that you would be earning if you were just putting that money into the stock market, as opposed to actually spending an R&D. And there's a cost to not earning those returns in the stock market because you're putting it into R&D. And so that ends up being a cost that they're bearing which they put into their formula of the prices that they should be getting back um, related to you know, the cost that they have actually spent on. But that's, that's really kind of exactly what you're saying, which is it's, it's neither here nor there, right? Yeah, it's not a real cost. I understand that. It but comes I back to the preferences point, the point of what I'm they could to do. Is that how, how do you use, how, what is the basis upon which you can try to find some common denominator in relation to the value of a car, mm -hmm. a meal, and a massage? other than saying how much we're willing to pay for a car, a meal, and a massage. How on, how, what other way is there of being able to say, here is a way in which you can understand the different notion of value, which is so wholly different in those, those examples? Right. So first of all, um, as I said, in the classicals, they did look also at demand. It just wasn't at the center. So they had the notion that somehow underlying the cost of a car, the center of gravity was around, sorry, the price of a car was around also how it was built, the, the, the cost of the labor, the cost of the machinery, the, the different conditions of production, including the degree to which division of labor was affecting productivity. You know. um, but then, of course, there was supply and demand, and that would affect the turbulence, for example. But the point in the book is not, so this is what I was saying, uh, the kind of mea culpa moment, where I was like, oh, maybe I should have gone more into what perhaps my own preferences would be for a more holistic view of value. The main point in the book for me is that when you no longer call the neoclassical price theory, which we've just been discussing, as a theory of value, because in fact only one theory of value is taught, so they don't even call it a theory of value, they literally, as I said, call it Econ 101, what does that then do to a, the way economists sort of talk to each other and the way that their students are trained. And it's really interesting today because there's a rethinking economics movement, which I think unfortunately sometimes has gone a bit too much into making existing economic theory more user-friendly. So they say we need less math, we need to make it more relevant, but it doesn't necessarily debunk some of the assumptions that are there about these issues. So when you no longer call it a theory of value, it becomes much harder to contest with another theory of value. And what was interesting in the previous period, which really actually continued up until, I'd say, the 1950s with, and, and up until 1970 with the big critique in Cambridge, the, the capital critique, the, the debate between Joan Robinson, Piero Strafa, and some neoclassical economists, that when we no longer had that kind of a contested terrain, value no longer was contested, it became much easier, and this is the key point in the book, for certain actors in the economy to present themselves as value creators. Um, and in the process, perhaps actually not do that, right? Not actually contribute to the investments required, both material and intangible, 
to actually producing higher quality goods and services in the economy, but just extract. Um, and, and, they, and it's not that value extraction didn't used to happen, but it didn't used to be dressed up as value creation. So the book focuses on the way in which that has been allowed by this boundary disappearing. And it's not about me saying where the boundary should be, but when it's invisible, who's to say? Who's valuable, who's not? So you're, obviously, you're, you're, in your presentation in the book, critical of kind of rent-seeking by um, the big digital companies and platforms. But is there something useful to your argument about the fact that it is so difficult for us to capture value in the digital economy? Is that something that's going to help to stir up this I think so. debate? Because, for example, there's a big discussion about whether or not we capture in our productivity figures yeah. digital values. Sure. So that's, but, but that's, um, that's a really useful debate, and that's also the book by um, Haskell and Westlake, Non-Intangible Capital. That's, that's not a very new debate. I think what, what they provide there is really interesting new thinking of how to capture intangible capital. But that's not necessarily, so put it this way. I'm not saying in the book that we haven't debated what goes into GDP. I mean, just read what the feminists have been writing for a long time, that care, you know, great intangible good is not measured properly. The care that you're providing at home for your kids or your, for your family or for the elderly, just because it doesn't have a price behind it, um, it's not going into GDP, and so there's been different people who've been thinking about how to do that. Or the opposite problem, the environmentalists saying, when we damage the economy, you know, bad caring for the environment, it doesn't make GDP go down, and there's been really good, interesting thinking about that for years, for decades. The intangible capital, in some ways, it's just part of that debate. It's, it's saying we don't capture it, you know, innovation of a certain sort when it's not done through this kind of more obvious metrics. Um, and similarly, people like Amartya Sen and Stiglitz and Fitusi, when they wrote that nice little book on happiness, they said, or, or well-being, sorry, they said, we're not including happiness indicators. My point is, before bringing stuff in, take stuff out. You know, could, you know, have we perhaps misunderstood or, or, or uh, conflated profits with rents, right? And is, lots of, is perhaps lots of what we're currently accounting for wealth actually just moving stuff around? that unearned income that the classicals were talking about, but when you don't have sort of an objective theory of value, it's also very hard to distinguish rents from profits because so much of the rent seeking actually happens through the presentation of yourself as a wealth creator. And that's where I'm welcoming the debate to be had equally. It's not instead of, it's not let's not do happiness indicators. It's just that, you know, as a, my husband often forces both me and the kids. He says, for every new thing you bring in the house, two things have to get out of the house. I would say the same thing with GDP. Before bringing in all this really great stuff, take out the rent. Now, just finally, for me, before I open it up, I mean, rent seeking, it's, great. it's a lovely term of abuse, actually. I, 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 I enjoy using it myself against people in a kind of random way. Um, uh, but I, let me introduce 150 rent seekers to you. You know, there's everyone in this room who's got a pension. There's everyone in this room who's got a life insurance policy. There's everyone in this room who, in one way or another, is a shareholder, directly or indirectly. They're, we are all rent seekers. I'm just in, interested in how useful is the concept of rent seeking, given that we're all at it. So again, I mean, I hate to always say that Marx was the brilliant one, but he was in, in, in this sense. He said, you know, circulation of capital and his breakdown in capital. He had his three volumes, one was on production, one on circulation, one on distribution. Um, it, it, it's not that that's not productive, right? So you could, I mean, so this isn't about saying what's productive, what's unproductive. Is how do you actually steer the circulatory mechanisms, whether it's how we distribute, whether it's um, with pensions, which of course are required in order for all of us to have better uh, lives when we're aging. How do you actually uh, steer the economy in such a way that you produce a particular type of uh, well-being, you know, in your older age. How do you use the financial system to better nurture uh, production and innovation? How do you, uh, you know, rethink, again, the pharmaceutical prices in such a way that it's actually producing the healthcare system that we want? It's putting the emphasis on the objectives and the value we want to create. This is the challenge, I think, of your book, and why it is, and I'm going to say this again at the end, everyone needs to actually read the book. Because I'm, I'm suspecting that a lot of people will not read your book, and they'll think Aww. your book... Hang on. But <laughs> just because a lot of people don't read books from beginning to end, you know. Um, they'll take it on holiday with them, but they won't necessarily read it from you. But um, the easy way of, of people misunderstanding your book is to think your book enables us to kind of take an Occam's razor to what is productive and what is unproductive, and that you are, in your book, defining use, 
But actually what you're doing is saying something much more complex and much more interesting. And that's um, why I changed the title, by the way. The initial title was um, The Value of Everything, colon, Makers and Takers um, in the Global Economy. And I said, no, 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 no that's going to do that. It's making and taking. Um, in other words, we can change, right? It's a verb. It becomes a verb. And it's not like you're a maker and I'm a taker. I can actually, in reshifting my activities, actually become part of the productive uh, sphere. And, and the kind of the words productive versus predatory that Miliband used, if that's not linked back to a wider understanding and discussion, contested discussion, none of this should be easy, about where value comes from, it actually doesn't lead to change. And so that was my call in the book, just bring it back to the center of debate. Instead, what's happened is value has gone from economics departments to business schools, you know, shared value, shareholder value, value chains, and which I don't want to completely bash business schools. I'll just say they're a bit less rigorous than us smart economists. And so when value just becomes this fuzzy thing there, it can become really abused. And that's the point. Bring it back to the Good. key way we discuss the economy. My goodness, look at these hands shooting up. So, uh, wow. Oh, dear. I think, yeah, right. OK, we'll, we'll just we'll do, we'll do three blocks. We'll do three in each block, and we'll do it as quickly as we can. Sorry, you went over time. I went over time. Um, right, we'll take a one, two, three here in that block. Um, thank you very much for, a talk, for that talk. The, what? Oh, sorry, my name's Mike. Um, I'm a recovering economist. Uh, that there's a missing actor, which is the accountancy profession, who are the people who legitimate all of these value claims. The whole thing about valuing of intangible assets is done through a set of accountancy rules, which PwC, etc., got the government to accept. And so we know Apple is worth N billions, not because of the number of iPads I'm sold in their warehouse, because the future value chain and the brand value of the Apple name, etc., are valued at N billion dollars. And are the accountancy firms in your firing line in the book along with like good targets like Goldman Sachs? Great. And then who was next? Uh, Hugh. Um, so this is international development. Um, so very easy to measure things. Uh, not necessarily the things you should measure and and measuring things because you can and then making decisions about what you're then going to do what I'm what I'm struck by is you've used the words wealth in a particular way you've used um, well-being you haven't used the word wisdom and I sense uh, there's a need for education which enables wisdom and a wise use of wealth because uh, in this country we have the modern slavery act 2015 and within the Modern Slavery Act is a requirement on CEOs and chairmen to clear their supply chain of any exploitative acts and report so in terms of their financial statement. What I was quite taken by though is without a proper education system, the consumer themselves will not make a supportive decision. So their desire to buy something cheap will mean an exploitative act somewhere else. So I was quite taken with some of the words you were speaking and I would like uh, your views on that. And yeah, got it. Yeah. Yes, I'm Simpson. My my um, dilemma is two issues mentioned in terms of the graph showing corporate the the rise in corporate wealth creation over the centuries and the issue of corporate governance with reference to the recent palaver, the, the crisis of, of the digital economy, how do you think that this could ever become reasonable in terms of the capitalist ethos of profit maximization as opposed to human value and wonder whether that is covered in within the redef redefining economic value you've got two minutes to answer those three questions right <laughs> oh, 
So then you have another round? Okay. Two more. So um, the first one on accountancy firms, which, by the way, I don't know if people realize Brexit is being currently managed by those accountancy firms because we've been able to decimate the civil service to such an extent that if we don't Brexit, it's not because we haven't, we've decided it's a bad idea. It's just we can't do it. <laughs> we don't know how to do it. But the cost of that is, is quite high in terms of what these uh, daily rates are that are being charged by those firms that you mentioned. Um, it's a kind of. There's four of them. It's a kind of take me now. It's a, I don't. I, there's no. Four of them. It's, it's just. A, it's a kind of like it's over kind of phrase, isn't it? Really? I just no. I, well, actually, you know I, I'm not sure I'm taking any more questions. Really. <laughs> but do you know what I actually propose? Um, I actually uh, said this. Sorry, this is a bit going off. But the Bartlett, which is where my institute is housed, is sort of architecture and design, and all these great artists are there and I said why don't you build a clock like and design it really well put in Trafalgar Square and do what the Times Square clock does which is all about you know the cost of the public deficit and say the cost of Brexit because we actually do know I mean direct cost forget the indirect cost which you know we know is huge the direct cost what it's actually costing <laughs> anyway sorry to the point to the point so first of all there's a whole stream of really interesting thinking for those interested in the question you asked this actually called critical accounting and this issue of performativity that I mentioned is exactly that point, that how we account for things, and what you've revealed is that the accounting firms have been central to that process, then feeds back into what is done and how that is not just talked about, but how we, again, measure the performance of different areas. And actually revealing that properly is one of the main things that this critical accounting uh, work does. And um, I learned recently from a colleague that the Jesuits actually you know, really thought this through. They said if they had a pot of money that was going to be used to do the kind of great things that the Jesuits wanted to do, you needed two keys. You needed one key from the procuratore, and this was the accountant, and another key from the rettore, the one with the vision. And you couldn't access the money without both kind of the accounting and the visionary of what it is we actually even want to do with the money, you know, a better health system, a greener economy. They were equally important. Whereas today what we have are accounting rules and misaccounting, for, partly for the reasons I was talking about, actually driving then the idea of what it is that can be done. Um, so incredibly important what you said. Um, let me just jump to the third one, the issues around corporate governance. So it's not just about profit maximization issues, and I think that that has been tackled by you know, lots of thinkers, including just to say profit maximization is not the same thing as growth maximization growth maximization, right? I mean, actually fostering long-term growth, resilient growth, sustainable growth, inclusive growth, um, could actually be a way that even under capitalism, uh, firms could be growing, but we have allowed certain firms, because it's not actually all firms. You can just look at telecoms, right? Huawei, Ericsson, very different from Cisco in terms of this overly uh, uh, financialized structure in terms of shareholder value emphasis. But my point is another one, which is that you know, the risk-reward relationship, who's getting what, again, blank fiend's quote, um, has been captured by not just the profit maximization thing, but how we measure profits and how we talk about wealth and how we talk about the wealth creators so that the actual risks being taken, which are much more communal, much more collective, are not accounted for. So we're socializing risks, privatizing rewards. And that's where I mentioned, I mean, the UBI stuff, my problem with UBI is that it's so passive. It's a handout, and it just reinforces this problem of some are creating the wealth, oh, and then we'll go hand it out a bit and redistribute it. And it's completely not surprising that the tech firms are supporting it, versus a citizen's share, a citizen's dividend in the wealth that they co-produced, right? Even just saying it makes me a bit more like, oh, yeah, a citizen's share versus a handout, you know? So uh, debunking these, these power relationships. And that comes back to the, the second question around well-being. Oh, God. Uh, 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 no, I won't get any more questions okay. in you. Do, you can get them. Uh, I'll we'll meet take, we'll the take, guy we'll later. Take, we'll take these three people here. Uh, uh, and by the way, you can have a UBI that is a citizen dividend, and, yeah. and it can be passive, yeah, yeah. not passive, but yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello, Pamela Corder, um, London South Bank University on the Early Childhood Studies Degrees Network. Um, I wanted to follow up your feminist point. Um, in your slide about what to do, you've got um, markets can be shaped and co-created. And I wondered who you were including in the co-creators. I mean, is it women who have children, and is it the caring? And Similarly, steering direction of growth through public purposes. How wide are you conceptualizing your public purposes? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Geoffrey Payne. I'd like to ask about land because that's not being created by anybody, but it is increasingly a source of value and also of inequality. I'd like to know how you think pub uh, land could be better managed in the public interest. Thank you. I would love to buy your book. My question is, uh, with my glib thinking, do you think that um, inequality and competition are important for business uh, or economical advancement? And do we really, really need a cashless society or economic advisors for our simple everyday life? Uh, yeah, you don't have to answer all those questions. I'll answer a couple. You can buy the book. Yeah, in a moment. Can you buy the book? What yeah. happens? <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive. No, you can. No, you can. It's outside. Uh. Right. Uh, go on. Okay. Calm oh. down. <laughs> He's terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God. Okay, the question on care, uh, very important because in fact that's what we're currently working on, which is this whole issue of public purpose, actually learning from some of the mission-oriented programs of the past, you know, going to the moon back again in a generation. That was a purely technological feat, but it was driven by, you know, sort of public ambition, a dream, but it was kind of one guy, Kennedy how to both choose these public purpose missions, both in the way we select them, engaging much more civil society, but also using the big challenges we have ahead around care, and that's the first one we mentioned and this report I've just put out, um, care as well as, of course, a more sustainable planet, but as long as these are just talked about as kind of broad challenges and talked about in this fuzzy way as opposed to really transforming them into concrete public purpose missions, um, it, you know, not much gets done. And the fact that the industrial strategy has just come back after years of being kind of a blasphema, the fact that also in Europe they're talking about directed growth, really focusing on how to get that co-investment cycle into real stuff as opposed to in the financial economy and using the big challenges we have around care to drive um, the notion of public purpose and public value, but in ways, again, that are not just then restricted to how we think of, you know, health care around drugs, but a more caring society is central. And people like Sue Himmelweit and the women of the budget group, I think, have, the women's budget group have been central. Land, I mean, land is the most obvious form of rent, right? And so in, it's not a surprise that in the old days they actually looked at the way in which landlords were extracting value based on the price of this um, scarce asset. But land itself and how we use land, coming back to the public purpose questions, how we actually transform existing resources into um, better resources, into part of the solution to a problem versus just a, a, a box where existing value is being nested, right? I mean, the, the finance, insurance, and real estate fire uh, area of the economy is becoming a pot where much of the wealth that's being generated is being housed simply to receive these kind of um, rents in the more classical way. That's the problem. And so how to get land to be seen as an area in which we invest in it and how we distribute the ownership of that land in more collective ways, but with these public purpose missions. What is it that we want from the land versus just seeing it as a planning problem, I think is central. And it's, again, something that we're trying to engage. Um, one of my... Uh, co no, 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 no. Just because it's yeah. you, we're going to break a golden rule and go three minutes over. Yeah. So I, I can take the one, two, three hands I can see on this side, but they're incredibly short questions. Uh, Nick Sherman, uh, international trade, um, does it create value? And what is a fair, uh, fair terms of trade? Nice, easy question. Uh, and then, yep. Hi, uh, my name is Alma Marston. Uh, I work on resilience and I wanted to ask you what you see as the relationship between how we define economic value and our long-term uh, resilience. Long-term resilience. Resilience. And then finally? Yeah, John Bryant, on the way here I went through Embankment Gardens, which is a public park valued by local office workers, I suspect, for their hour off so they can sit in the sunshine. But it's, it's real value, land value, if it was developed, would be millions. How do we measure the quality and the goodness of having a public park in central London? Are all those questions answered in your book, Maria? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank all those questions are answered okay. in the book. Um, no. Let me just, I mean, let me especially tackle this trade question because this, you know, I mean, I wasn't joking when I said that Trump is bringing us in some ways back to a mercantilist 
era where we're just thinking about exchange rates. And I mean, in some ways, Brexit also brings us back to that, right? There's walls, and then we worry immediately about, you know, exchange rates again because of what Brexit is doing to that, but also it becomes of, you know, this personal relationships, the Nissan deal. It's all about deals, getting right deal versus the kind of investments that are actually required to get us the kind of growth, the kind of productivity increases, the kind of uh, uh, type of in, uh, innovation that we require to have a better society here. That doesn't mean, though, that terms of trade aren't important. So the reason that NAFTA went wrong, and, and I think Trump is right, NAFTA did go wrong, as, as problematic as his, than his narrative around it, is because it was basically a race to the bottom. Um, and I can't remember the name of the Belgian politician um, who I actually met several times. He's very good. His, his uh, critique to the deal that was also being struck between Europe and Canada was about you know, those details and the degree to which you actually explicitly recognize a stakeholder uh, uh, value proposition and that value is created collectively makes it then much harder to negotiate these deals, which are a race to the bottom for who? Basically for workers in terms of wages and also conditions of work, uh, because they are valued. They are going to be central to the value that's, that is required, to the conditions of production that are required to get us a wealthier, more valuable society. And so terms of trade, the degree to which they can actually be used in the kind of international trade deals to upgrade and to steer the economy in ways that I think many of the questions were getting at. So more inclusive society, more sustainable, greener growth, new forms of long-term investments, patient finance, not speculative short-term finance. Those terms of trade are directly related to where we think and how we think value is produced. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for your uh, questions. Uh, all questions will be fully uh, answered in the book, which is available outside. <laughs> Uh, in an act of supreme irony, Mariana will, by the effortless act of signing your book, increase its value, which seems to me to be a kind of benign rent-seeking of some form that I can't quite explain. Uh, but it just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Mariana Mazzucato. Thank you.